The EFAST exam, Extended Focused Assessment with Sonography and Trauma, not just for trauma anymore. Many slides and images of this talk are courtesy of J. Christian Fox of UC Irvine Medical Center. The EFAST exam. I'm going to talk about the extended focused assessment with sonography and trauma, but this is not just for trauma anymore. The indications for the EFAST exam are blunt and penetrating thoracoabdominal trauma, trauma or abdominal pain in pregnant patients, or unexplained hypotension in any patients. This is useful even in the intensive care unit uh, for assessment of patients in shock as part of the RUSH exam, or rapid ultrasound and shock exam. Contraindications to the EFAS exam are clear and identifiable other immediate needs for the operating room. You do not want to be performing an ultrasound that's going to delay transport to the operating room when it's clear that the patient needs to go. The EFAS exam is not as accurate as CT, but it is faster. It's better than diagnostic peritoneal lavage, which is rarely used anymore, and is superior to our physical examination. It is the best initial screening test in trauma, and you'll often see this done on patients rolling into the ER after any blunt or penetrating trauma. The FAST scan, focused assessment with sonography and trauma, was the original scan, and EFAST simply adds the um, evaluation of pneumothorax to the FAST scan. It is bedside, non-invasive, repeatable, rapid, with no contraindications. The EFAS scan, again, not just for the abdomen anymore. We are looking for hemopericardium, hemoperitoneum, hemothorax, but now we're adding pneumothorax to the evaluation. There are five EFAST windows. The two chest windows with using the high frequency probe to evaluate for lung sliding and evidence of pneumothorax anteriorly. These are supine patients on a backboard generally. The right upper quadrant view for the Morrison's pouch the cardiac view, subcostal and parasternal long axis view, to look for pericardial effusions, left upper quadrant view of the splenorenal recess, and the pelvic view, the retro um, vesicle view. In terms of the thoracoabdominal anatomy, the target point is that intersection where the diaphragm separates the thorax and the abdomen. We try to find this location, and in patients it can be in very different positions. COPD patients may have it very low and the pregnant patients may have it very high. But you want to move your probe, and this is the low frequency probe that can penetrate deeply but not with giving you a great amount of detail. And you want to find that intersection. In the right upper quadrant, here you see the low frequency probe with the indicator towards the patient's head. And what we're scanning through the liver to look for Morrison's pouch. Here's an example of Morrison's pouch. At this point, right between the liver and the kidney, there is typically a white stripe of perinephric fat, and there should not be any black or extra pelvic fluid. You need to move the probe from the diaphragm to the lower pole of the kidney because you can have fluid collected around the lower pole, but it's not seen in a higher cut. So you don't want to assume just because you see the superior pole of the kidney looking clear that the entire Morrison's pouch is clear. Here's an example of the right upper quadrant, the head and the foot orientation, and you can see a triangular stripe of black fluid in the Morrison's pouch. Now remember that fluid that is not within a viscous tends to be, um, tends to have sharp angles and not be circular. Fluid that's within a viscous, such as a bowel or a bladder, tends to have circular uh, shape to it. The sub xiphoid window is looking specifically for tamponade or signs of pericardial effusion or hemopericardium. This is a subcostal view where you can see the two layers of the pericardium separated, the right ventricle and the left ventricle. And here's a still view of what the anatomy should look like in the absence of pericardial effusion. This bright white hyperechoic layer right here is the, peri is the pericardium. The layers together are bright white and when they're separated you can very clearly see them. From the parasternal long axis view, the indicator points towards the patient's right shoulder. And the view you get is the apex here, 
the base towards the head. Uh, in this particular view, it was taken in abdomen um, settings, so the dot is on the opposite side of the screen. But still, when you're in the cardiac settings with a phased array probe, the indicator is towards the right shoulder. If you're in the abdom abdominal settings, then the indicator is towards the left hip. Just be sure that when you get the orientation that the image ends up looking like this orientation with the apex towards the left of the screen. And here you have your right ventricle, left ventricle, left atrium, and back here you can see some fluid outside. In the left upper quadrant, we're looking for the splenorenal recess, and typically we have to go more posterior and superior to get this view. When you're looking at Morrison's pouch, you're usually mid-axillary line. But when you're looking at the splenorenal recess, you often have to put your knuckles all the way on the bed and angle up to see the splenorenal intersection. Be careful because fluid in the stomach can be mistaken for free fluid. And remember what we talked about, that fluid that's within a viscous tends to have rounded edges and fluid outside a viscous tends to have sharp edges. Here's an example of the splenorenal recess with free fluid with sharp edges between the spleen and the kidney. In the left upper quadrant, fluid can also track above the spleen, so you want to get a good view of the diaphragm as well. When you move to the suprapubic view, you get both a sagittal and a transverse view. The transducer should be just superior to the pubic symphysis, and you should fan into the pelvis and looking side to side, looking for these wedges of anechoic fluid. Here's an example of the bladder, the vesicouterine space in females, the rectouterine space in the uterus. You can clearly see all of these on the ultrasound. The transverse view, you turn the indicator towards the patient's right, and you fan down into the pelvis to get a transverse view. And if you were to see free fluid, it would appear outside of the viscous behind the bladder at the lowest point in the pelvis. Here you can see a stripe of fluid behind the bladder. Here's the bladder fluid, the wall of the bladder, and then there is fluid with angular edges behind the bladder. This is free fluid. And in a trauma patient, this is blood until proven otherwise. Here's a view where the bladder is empty, but you can clearly see some peristalsis of the bowel here. You have peristalsis and then you have fluid outside of the bowel wall with the sharp edges. So the FAST exam has four major windows. The first window of the FAST exam is Morrison's pouch. And with the indicator towards the patient's head, we place the probe at about the 10th intercostal space. And what we're going to do is we're going to need to slide the probe superior and inferior. And then we're going to be fanning the probe anterior and posterior in order to see all the way through the interface of the liver and the kidney. The next window of the FAST exam is the sub xiphoid view of the heart. We start at the liver. We use the liver as our window to see the heart. We start over here at the liver, and then we slide up into the sub xiphoid notch. I've got my indicator towards the patient's right, and the cable is exiting the bottom of my hand. And I'm fanning, and I'm applying more pressure, and as the patient takes a deep breath, the heart comes right down towards my transducer. And then the next window of the FAST exam is the parasternal long window of the heart. I place the probe with my indicator towards the patient's left hip. I place the probe right on the sternum, and then I simply slide off until I see this long axis of the heart come down my screen. We're getting a long axis view of the heart with the indicator towards the patient's left hip. The next window of the FAST exam involves the spleno-renal view with the indicator towards the patient's head I'm over this area of the 10th intercostal space with the indicator towards the patient's head mid-axillary line, and I'm sliding superiorly and inferiorly, trying to get the entire contents of the splenorenal window in my view, and I'm fanning anteriorly and posteriorly until I get the optimal window. Recall that the stomach lies anterior to the spleen, so if I fan too far anteriorly, I'm going to have that stomach in my view, and I really may need to fan more posteriorly sometimes sliding the probe posteriorly. And the final window of the FAST exam is the suprapubic window. This window is comprised of a transverse view with the indicator of the patient's right, and then a sagittal view with the indicator of the patient's head. 
In each of these windows, transverse and sagittal, I'm going to be fanning all the way from side to side and anterior and I should say superior and inferior in order to obtain this complete window. So that was Dr. Chris Fox at UC Irvine describing the FAST exam. And again, the eFAST would add the pneumothorax evaluation and two chest windows using the high frequency probe as well. And one comment on the video um, Dr. Fox and UCI tends to teach the cardiac ultrasound in um, abdominal or ER settings, meaning they have the indicator towards the left side of the screen and therefore um, they orient their probe opposite to the cardiac convention. But since the indicator is towards the other side of the screen and the probe is flipped 180, the image ends up looking the same. So talk about a little bit about artifacts. Artifacts can actually help us um, in this evaluation. There's such a thing as a mirror image artifact, which is a normal, when you have a normally aerated lung, the ultrasound beam comes and glances off the very reflective diaphragm. It takes a few extra milliseconds to get back up to the probe. That extra time, the probe interprets time as depth and therefore creates the image of another liver on the other side of the diaphragm deeper. However, this is only a situation that occurs when the lung is fully aerated. If there's fluid or consolidation on the other side of the diaphragm in the lung, then the ultrasound beam will be transmitted through and not reflected off. So you will not see mirror image in patients who have fluid in their chest. Hemothorax or normal. On the right, we have the typical mirror image artifact. Looks very much like liver. If this were a deeper view, we'd be able to see the spine and it would stop right at the diaphragm. Here we have what appears to be hemothorax. You have black, which looks like fluid, and it looks like the appearance of grayscale or a hematocrit. Some pitfalls. Sometimes epicardial fat is mistaken for pericardial fluid. The epicardial fat has some echogenicity, but it tends to move with the heart. Pericardial fluid is anechoic in general, and it's a stripe that can change uh, size with, with beats, so it will become larger and smaller depending on whether the heart is contracting or expanding. Um, however, the fluid can clot. Here's an example of pericardial clot. Actually, the clot ends up being almost like liver in texture and can be very difficult to see. Here's the liver, pericardial clot, and the heart, which is in this case a standstill. Again, discussing the fluid in the stomach. Differentiating fluid in the stomach from hemoperitoneum is important. The fluid within the viscous will have rounded edges. It is anterior to the spleen, so if you're fanning too far anterior, you might run into fluid in the stomach. They're both anechoic, but the shape is very important. And the fluid in the stomach obviously would not layer between the kidney and the spleen. There's case reports that describe the false positive uh, FAST exam that ends up being fluid in the stomach. some more examples. Here you have the spleen, you have the kidney, and you have free fluid with this nice sharp edges above and between the kidney and the spleen. In this image you have kidney, spleen, and you have stomach fluid, more anterior. There are algorithms that you can follow uh, with a positive FAST versus a negative FAST in a trauma patient, and it very much depends on the stability of the patient as to whether they have the time to go to the CT scan to further differentiate where the source of the bleeding is versus going straight to the OR. Many times when you have a negative FAST in an unstable patient, the source of the bleeding is obvious elsewhere. A few more examples. Rectovesical pouch full of anechoic fluid. Diaphragm with free fluid above. Bowel peristalsing floating around in fluid.
fluid between the spleen and the kidney. Sharp edges. And again, a picture of the hemothorax. Normal mirror image. This is a great example here. When there's air in the lungs, the air will completely scatter the ultrasound, so you will not be able to see anything behind the air. Therefore, pay attention to the spine shadow here, how it stops right at the diaphragm. If this were a fully consolidated lung that was very dense, you'd be able to see the, st the spine above the diaphragm. And in this case, you can even see the vessel, the mirror image vessels of the liver in the chest. So this is a normal aerated lung with no fluid. Mirror image artifact. And here we have a positive fast. This, there's not a black stripe between the kidney and the liver, but there is actually quite a bit of epicardial, excuse me, perinephric fat. Fat tends to be a little bit hyperchoic. Here we can see a flicker of a heartbeat, and we see this liver-like substance around, and we see what looks like a layer of the pericardium around the heart and further separated and this would be a clot in the pericardium. So in summary the EFAS we look at the hepatorenal recess, cardiac, pericardium, splenorenal recess, suprapubic area and then we add lung sliding bilaterally to rule out pneumothorax. There have been many cost analyses of point of care ultrasound and trauma patients and in general, it turns out that patients who are randomized to get FAST scans, and this is you know, six years ago, seven years ago, were shown to have faster time to the operating room, fewer CT scans, spent more than a quarter fewer days in the hospital, had fewer complications, and were charged less. If you have any questions about this talk, feel free to contact me.